Welcome to Lawton Online with your host, Andrew Lawton. He's locked, loaded, and ready to fire. Lawton Online starts right now. Welcome back to Lawton Online. It's been a long week. Actually, it's been the exact same amount of time as usual, but I've missed you. Maybe especially more this week with the holidays upon us. I don't know. In any case, this is Lawton Online. My name is Andrew Lawton. You are tuned in on the Rebel.media, and I am just thrilled about it because we have a very special episode of the podcast this week. I'm going to be playing in just about so oh, I don't even know it's a po- like I've said it's a podcast you can't really take timing for granted uh, but playing very shortly within this show anyway an interview I did this week with Rana Ambrose the honorable Rana Ambrose I should say This is the woman who is the interim leader of the Conservative Party, and as such, she is the leader of the official opposition. And though she won't be the next Prime Minister of Canada, because she can't seek the permanent leadership of the Conservative Party, she is a woman in a very unique situation because she has the ability to really shape and transform the Conservative Party as it goes from its current form, which is politically not the most powerful, to its next form, which is potentially returning to government in Canada. So we're going to be chatting with uh, Rana Ambrose very shortly, just about some of the priorities that she has for the party, what she thinks the party should uh, do on a couple of key issues, and that is expected to be a very enjoyable uh, interview for you, I hope. That's coming up very shortly. Uh, Also going to be talking about a whole smattering of issues here, Uh, but I wanted to kick off with some very good news for those of us who are Christians, but more importantly, good news for those of us who believe in religious liberty as a hallmark of a free society. The city of Toronto has reconsidered its decision to ban Christian music from a publicly owned and publicly managed square. You may remember the story. It was covered by very little in in the way of uh, mainstream media. I know the Toronto Sun had a column about it, but that was because of uh, fellow rebel Faith Goldie writing it, and LifeSite News wrote about it. But this was not a big story. You can imagine that if a Muslim group was told they couldn't have an event in a public square, they couldn't pray in Young Dundas Square, they couldn't sing or dance or whatever it is that they do in a public square, they wouldn't hesitate to share that information. The media would not hesitate to report it, nor should they, because it would be a gross overreach by the state to deny any religious group the right to assemble freely and peacefully over music, prayer, or even just a tea party. It doesn't really matter. Yet that's not what happened. Voices of the Nations, a Christian group, wanted to have a concert this July, or next July, I suppose, at Young and Dundas Square, which is kind of like Canada's pale imitation of Times Square in New York. And I've been there before. It's a very busy area, very built up, very active always. There are people going every which way. There's a subway station there. You have tall buildings, big screens. There's a hard rock cafe in the corner. It's a happening place. Events are there all the time. There have been pro-Israel rallies there. There have been anti-Israel rallies there. There have been people assembling for political purposes even. And there have been people that have just had big outdoor concerts. Because, you know what, it's a square, you've got to have some fun with it, and you've got to use it to get your money's worth out of it. Well, Voices of the Nations wanted to have access to those people there. They wanted to be downtown. They wanted to rent it for the annual music festival that it's having in July. However, the city of Toronto denied that right. They have a policy against proselytizing. That's their word, proselytizing. And that was what they they said was going to happen if Voices of the Nations had its concert. Now, by the way, when the spokesperson was defending the policy, Natalie Berman, the manager of events for Young Dundas Square, this is what she said, quote, Well, it doesn't matter if it's speaking or singing. Either way, if you're praising Jesus or praise the Lord and there's no God like Jehovah, that type of thing, that's proselytizing. Unquote. 
Now, what's interesting, and this was actually pointed out by uh, Faith Goldie, it's been pointed out by John Carpe from the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms, there's precedent for not throwing down the hammer on the event like this. Hare Krishna mantras were uttered last June at Young Dundas Square. A candlelight vigil against Islamophobia was held in February of 2015. And out of the realm of proselytizing events, there have been pro-pod events there. There have been pride events. There has even been Christmas caroling, which, oh my goodness, if you mention the birth of Jesus in a song, wouldn't that be proselytizing? I don't know. Forgetting the fact for a moment that the city of Toronto appears to have a very loose understanding of what proselytizing is and what that word means, I say, who cares? If you had a group of Christian missionaries that were out there handing out Bibles saying, we think that everyone is saved by a relationship through God, and you're going to hell if you don't find Jesus now, I think they should have that right. Just as I think any Muslim group that wants to get out there and say, you will go to hell if you do not adopt Islam. You will go to hell if you do not recognize that Muhammad is the prophet. They should have that right. Buddhists who want to meditate with signs above their head that say, come meditate like us and your life will be great, they should have that right. If Jews want to get together and they want to talk about their faith, they should have that right. This is not a difficult concept to grasp. You can call it proselytizing all you want. I call it freedom. Religious freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, all of which are hallmarks of a free society. Now, if a public venue exists as a public venue with public management, public funding, a government mandate, you better be darn sure that they have an obligation to uphold freedom for every single group that wants to assemble there. If we were looking at a private concert hall that said, you know what, I don't like Christians, I don't want Christians there. I would absolutely disagree with their decision. I might even fight them on it in the court of public opinion. But I would never deny their right to do that. The line is different. The line divides public and private very effectively. If you are a public entity, you need to be a voice for freedom or allow other people to have voices for freedom. Now, the good news is they've backed away on this. There were legal challenges. There were, despite the fact that it was only from a small subset of voices in Canada, still voices that were calling out Young and Dundas Square in the city of Toronto for this, and I'm glad. You don't need to have the Toronto Star and CBC and the Globe and Mail writing a front-page feature about you. Voices are heard. Odd enough that the organization in question, Voices of the Nations, relied on a small number of voices from this nation to allow this decision to be reversed. The concert will move forward. On November 9th, uh, petitions with over 40,000 signatures were delivered to John Tory's office, and John Tory had stated publicly that he supported them being able to continue using Dundas uh, Young Square, Young Dundas Square, rather. And yeah, forgetting for the fact that they had had events there in the past before, I, I don't get it. You know, I tried to call uh, Natalie Bellman when this whole thing erupted, and she might have been busy. She didn't answer her phone. I tried a couple of times uh, before my show. I wanted to, her to be able to say to me on my show, say to my listeners, what it is, what it is that is so allegedly offensive about, as she calls it, praise the Lord, and there's no God like Jehovah. Oh my goodness, they sent chills down my bones. Those things are so offensive. But religious freedom won out. Religious freedom won out. And that is such a good thing because you know what? Freedom always wins. And I said this to someone uh, on my show who had called in and I said those exact words. And this happened a few weeks ago. And they said, well, that's such an American concept. Really? Since when is freedom an American concept? You know, I know pretty well the leader of the Freedom Party of Ontario, Paul McKeever, and he once uh, responded to someone who said the Freedom Party is a fringe party. He said, since when is freedom fringe? But sadly, we live in a day and age where it's not the norm. You know, I was embroiled in something of a social media controversy. It wasn't even a controversy last week. Someone wanted to make it a controversy. And I had shared a photo of a group of Syrian refugees, the first batch of, or the second batch of Syrian refugees arriving at uh, Toronto Pearson International Airport. 
And one of the first refugees in the line had a Michael Kors suitcase in which their luggage was packed. And I didn't really uh, care that much. I just uh, shared the photo that someone had posted and put the little caption. I said, oh, I can't wait until Michael Kors unveils its new refugee line of luggage, or, or I hope this is a selection from the Michael Kors line of refugee luggage, whatever the case may be. An innocuous enough comment. Some people were taking it to mean something more. Other people were, were utterly just unimpressed or, or didn't care. And other people were like, oh, ha ha, that's funny. I meant it as a little aside. Doesn't really matter. Anyway, some guy sees this, says, I'm going to demand that Andrew Lawton be taken off the air for this racism. And I, I just chuckled. I, I, I really don't care that much about stuff like that or, or people like that. But it was a, a comment, and this was all happening on my Facebook. I was just sitting back and watching at this point <laughs> because I was like, nothing good's going to come of me getting in on this. But then he, he wrote or someone else wrote later on, I'm all for free speech, but this is racism. Now, setting aside for a moment the fact that it wasn't racism, even if it was, free speech does not know that limitation. There's no I support free speech, but I can't remember who it was. I think it was a British humorist that said, if anyone says a sentence that has the word but in it, you can disregard everything before the but. Just as if someone says, I'm not a racist, but, well, there probably are if they, if they preface it with that. Or I don't hate so-and-so, but, well, okay, maybe you do. There is no but when you're talking about freedom. There are plenty of asses, I can assure you, but there is no but in that case as a uh, conjunction. So why is it that people are so focused on the limitations? It is a binary. You either support religious freedom or you do not. And people will always go to the extremes. Oh, well, what if your religious freedom says blow people up? Well, then you're getting into the right to life, the right to your own autonomy, the right to your own independence, the right to your freedom as a victim of this. But any religious freedom that involves speaking about your religion, proselytizing, is a freedom that Canadians hold and Canadians need to preserve and Canadians need to protect and the courts need to protect it as well. And one issue that I'm going to be talking about, I know in greater detail later on, uh, I I guess not later on this year, because there are only a couple of shows left this year, uh, but certainly next year, is Trinity Western University. This is another school that's become the battleground on this whole religious freedom question. And the school keeps winning. The school keeps winning. A number of law societies in Canada have tried to throw down the gauntlet and say, we will not recognize lawyers from this school because it's a Christian school that expects students to adhere to traditional evangelical Christian guidelines. Like, for example, no sex before marriage. Like, for example, no gay sex. Like, for example, no drunkenness. Now, for most people, that pretty much takes away everything that they actually did at university. But for some people, that is what they want. Or at least they want the education and they're okay signing the so-called morality covenant and not following it. And I don't think the school enforces it, but the fact is a school that most people in Canada would never have heard of and would never have gone to all of a sudden became subject to people who aren't Christians, don't believe in Christianity, and aren't prospective students wanting to weigh in and vet their curriculum and vet their rules and guidelines for students. That's Trinity Western in a nutshell. People who are not affected or impacted by it trying to change what happens there. Well, what happened? Trinity Western fought back and has had victories in court in Nova Scotia. Just uh, last week had a victory in court in B.C. Is expecting to uh, be heard uh, in the battle against Ontario, the biggest law society in the country, before the Supreme Court. And I think this needs to happen. And the courts, I think, will continue ruling with Trinity Western because remember that public-private line I spoke about earlier in the show? Trinity Western is a private university. Private funding. Students decide to go there. If they were getting public funding, I'd say, okay, the rules are changing. But they're not. They're entirely self-funded. Students are entirely self-funded or they take bank loans or get scholarships or grants, whatever the case may be. If you don't want to go there, don't. But the fact of the matter is, no one has ever been able to, with Trinity Western, deny that the legal education will be on par with what other law schools offer. 
And if the whole question is that we don't want lawyers to have unpopular views, well, I'm afraid that ship has already sailed. I think I've probably told this story on my show before, so I'll give a bit of an abbreviated version. But I can name a lawyer right now who's a 9-11 truther. I can name a lawyer who is a Holocaust denier. I can name lawyers who are liberal. I, not that they're all the same, but let's face it, they're not things that I agree with in any case. So are we going to say that there sh needs to be this monolithic existence of what a lawyer can think or feel or believe? Are we saying that we won't accredit a Christian lawyer that goes to another school? After all, if we want to eradicate uh, Protestant Christianity from the legal profession, why not go after the lawyers instead of just one school? Or why don't we stop accrediting uh, lawyers who get their education from a Christian university in the U.S.? We still have a couple of those, like Brigham Young as an example, whose lawyers can practice in Canada despite the fact that students have to adhere to a very similar covenant. So let's call a spade a spade here. This is not an attack on anyone but Christians, just as the decision by the Young Dundas Square administrators were attacks on Christians. That's all that's happening here. And I'd never want to conflate this form of discrimination with actual persecution that occurs against people in other parts of the world. So when I use the word persecution, I'm not using it in that dramatic way. It is a discrimination, though. It is a discrimination. No one is dying, but we are still being denied our constitutional rights. And I've met, by the way, people on the right that are prepared to suspend constitutional liberties for Muslims. And I think that's wrong. I've been unequivocal about that. And the great thing about having consistency on this issue is that I've had people say to me, oh, well, would you support it if a Muslim group wanted to have a concert in Young Dundas Square? And I say, absolutely. And people always get pushed back because they're expecting me to say no. What do I have to be afraid of? If a Muslim wants to proselytize me, I'll just say no. If a Christian wants to proselytize to me, I'll say, hey, someone else already got me, but thank you. It's like the equivalent in religion of like I already donated at the other store. I did. You guys already got me. You're good. If a Jewish person wants to proselytize to me again, I will say I'm all right, but I love Israel. Thanks anyway. We shouldn't be afraid of this big, bad ogre that apparently is religion to civil servants. We've got to take a quick break here. When we come back in just a couple of moments, we will have conservative leader Ronna Ambrose here on Lawton Online on the rebel.media. Stay tuned. He's irreverent, intelligent, and indefatigable. You're tuned in to Lawton Online with Andrew Lawton. Welcome back to Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. We always, 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 as uh, Canadians who I'm going to assume are aligned more to the right, I think anyway are interested in what's happening in the Conservative Party of Canada. Not always supportive, but I think interested. You know, as the biggest voice for conservatism or perceived conservatism in Canada, I think that what they do matters. What that party does matters. Now, I voted uh, for the Conservatives in the last election. I was happy to do so. I thought Stephen Harper was a much better uh, voice for the right than uh, Justin Trudeau was, and uh, now we can say will be. And now we have a new interim leader for the Conservative Party. Now, this is not a permanent leadership. Ronna Ambrose, who is a, an Edmonton area MP, is only running the party for the next couple of years. She is ineligible for the permanent leadership, or at least for the more permanent leadership. But that doesn't mean that she is not relevant. I think she's incredibly relevant because the conservatives need to rebuild. The conservatives need to grow and move. And the question becomes whether they put together a better machine and keep doing the same things or whether the policy itself shifts, whether that is a shift to the center, a.k.a. the left or a shift to the right. Or do they stick to their guns and focus on running a better campaign? These are all questions that need to be answered by the next leader, by the eventual leader of the party. But they are questions where the groundwork is set and will be set by Ronna Ambrose and the team that she assembles. 
Now, I don't know, nor do I have any inside knowledge on who the next leader of the party is going to be. I know who the names that you know are. People like Jason Kenney, Michelle Rempel, Lisa Raitt, Kelly Leach, Aaron O'Toole. These are a few of the names of people who I think are strong contenders or at least likely contenders. Who's going to win over the support of the Conservative Party's membership? That stands to be seen. There seem to be some voices not only from the center, but also some uh, far more right-aligned voices in that pack. Jason Kenney strikes me as one who would be a, a very good leader. Michelle Rempel, I don't know enough about. She seems to be approaching things, for the most part, from the right side. Peter McKay, I like him, but again, he's coming if he steps into the race, as a lot of people have called for him to, as the old PC guy. He was the former PC leader when the Conservative Party was formed in the first place at the time that Stephen Harper won from the Alliance and Progressive Conservative Parties. So that's a couple of years out. What are the priorities of the Conservative Party now? We've had uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau out of the gate do a lot of things. He's already started to talk about uh, Aboriginal issues, and we had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report. He's already started talking about uh, refugees and has acted on that. He broke his promise, but still, he is acting on it. He's already started talking about climate change. He had the Paris Summit, and remember, this was the first priority that he had for Canada. Climate change, not terrorism, climate change. So even if I don't like the things that he's doing and saying, I can't deny that he has hit the ground running. Now, as official opposition, it is the job of the Conservative Party to challenge the government, to question the government. Their ability to stop legislation is non-existent now with a liberal majority. So even though the role of official opposition leader may be more of a ceremonial one, it still has to be the chief watchdog of the government. So I had on my show on AM980 in London, Ontario this week, Ronna Ambrose on, the Honourable Ronna Ambrose, to talk about a number of the issues that are going to come up in Canada, that are going to come up for the Conservative Party, and more importantly, what her role will be as official opposition leader. So very pleased to share uh, that interview with you now in full. Uh, This is Ronna Ambrose and myself on AM980. Uh, Ms. Ambrose, it's great to talk to you again in this new role, so congratulations. Thank you, Andrew. How are you? Oh, doing very well, thank you. How are you enjoying the new house? Well, it's beautiful. Uh, It's sort of like living in a museum because it's full of all this Canadian, these little Canadian treasures here and there. Uh, Because it's it's a state home, like the other official residences that you find in Ottawa, um, so you got to be really careful where you put your uh, glass down. <laughs> you don't leave a ring. <laughs> yeah, I saw a piece, I think it was in the Ottawa Citizen, uh, kind of a year in review, and there were some wonderful pictures of, of you in the house, and all I could think of is how terrifying uh, it would be for me to live there, because I am a klutzy person <laughs> generally. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I, w- I would sort of restrict myself to maybe one corner of each room, but uh, it seems to suit you, so that's very good. Thanks so much. Uh, so, so let's talk a little bit about what this position is like uh, for you coming in, because you're, you're not an outsider by any stretch. You've been in, in Parliament for uh, quite a while. You, you've been a cabinet, so you've obviously uh, had a, a, a lot of relationships with your, your fellow caucus members, although there are some new ones here. Are you coming in and, and trying to reinvent the wheel here until a new leader is selected, or is your role more to maintain until that person comes in and makes some bigger changes? Well, first of all, I'm I'm thrilled to be the leader of the opposition, uh, and I I love the role because I can tell you as a conservative, um, all of us feel always a, a little sense of discomfort when you're in government and you're spending taxpayer money. So we love being on the other side, getting to hammer the government for already breaking their promise on the ten billion dollar deficit and at their spending promises. So. Listen, it's great to be a conservative up against what is going to be a very big spending, big government, uh, liberal party. Um, I love the role. I'm thrilled that my my caucus uh, elected me to lead them. And and it's an exciting time for the party because we do have an opportunity to really be the voice of taxpayers up against a government that we know will 
at some point be raising taxes. Well, they've already raised taxes, but we think they'll have to raise taxes more because of the large deficits that they'll take on. We're going to be that check and balance, and we're going to be t- a tough opposition. Do you think the Conservative Party under uh, Prime Minister Stephen Harper went away from being a taxpayer advocate in recent years with focusing a lot on issues like uh, the NECAB as, as probably one of the most notable examples from the election? Well, I do think that we always do well when we focus on our core values. And we have a very successful party. Yes, we were defeated in the last election. But if you put that into perspective, we started out the election at 32 percent of the popular vote. We ended at 32 percent of the popular vote and the Liberals uh, ended with 39 percent. So they did beat us by 7 percent. But this was not a massive defeat. We have 99 members of parliament on the conservative team. That's a very strong opposition. Uh, We've got a team that's ready to be that voice for taxpayers. And listen, this is a very, uh, a very, very left wing liberal party. This is not a liberal party of the Paul Martin liberals that believe in keeping taxes down and balanced budgets. This, this could be, and I feel bad for Tom will care because Everything these guys are doing is what he would like to be doing. So, you know, you see recent polls showing that the new Democrats uh, out there are loving Justin Trudeau. Well, because his platform is very left wing and he has no problem racking up big spending, raising people's taxes and finding a government solution to cure everything that ails Canadians. So this is going to be an intrusive, big government. And When you look at what we stand for in terms of low taxes and balanced budgets and individual liberty and fighting against that big government mentality that only governments can fix all problems, we have a lot to offer Canadians in the Conservative family and the Conservative movement. And so I think that contrast will really serve us well to reach out to Canadians and and tell them that they have a home in the Conservative Party and in the Conservative movement as we move forward to find a new leader in our leadership race. Uh, is there a concern that you have, though, Ms. Ambrose, that in a lot of ways Canadians are moving more and more towards a comfort or, or at the very least a complacency with big government? Because we, we've seen this in Ontario as an example where uh, the government has uh, wanted to put in a, a new provincial retirement pension plan, and I know uh, former Finance Minister Joe Oliver was was very strong in, in advocating against that. We've seen uh, you know items like carbon tax be floated federally and provincially uh, for Ontario and Canadians alike. Is there a concern that Canadians are, are getting comfortable with the idea, that idea of government being the nanny, if you will? Well, I think that's why you have to offer a very clear alternative. And you have to make the case that, uh, for, for instance, for carbon pricing, you have to make uh, a case for using market-oriented solutions for reduction of carbon that it's not just about slapping another tax on something that will somehow cure it. We've seen in other jurisdictions like Sweden and Norway where long-term carbon taxes didn't actually do anything to reduce carbon. So I think that there is a tipping point, especially now that we see provinces across the country. There's very few conservative governments left provincially. We're seeing NDP liberal governments across the country raise people's taxes at the provincial level, that now the combined tax rate for a lot of people is over 50%. Now, you layer on top of that the fact that the new liberal government under Trudeau has introduced a middle-class tax cut that actually we found, find out now isn't really going to do anything uh, for the economy because it's going to cost the government $1.4 billion. And then layer on top of that, they're going to introduce new EI, new CPP. All of that affects the bottom line of businesses. And then on top of that, you layer on top another potential national carbon tax. And I can guarantee you that won't be revenue neutral. So people are so heavily regulated in tax now at all different levels. I mean, under the Conservative government, our taxes were the lowest they'd been in 50 years. So at least people could count on not getting another layer of taxation at the federal level. But now that's going to change. And I hope there's a tipping point where people say enough is enough. And people, wa- I mean, I think people want to keep more of their money and they should. I mean, th- that goes to individual liberty at the most basic level that you can make decisions about what you do with your money for your family, for your business spend that money in your community. It's good for the economy. It's good for prosperity. So that's a very conservative message philosophically. And that's, you know, we're going to be 
holding this government to account in a very strong, tough way uh, and advocating those conservative principles. And I think I don't know anyone in Canada that doesn't believe in those things and wants to see more of that from their government. So when the government spends money, they better have a good reason why they're spending it, because it all comes from the same place, and that's out of the pockets of Canadians. And on the note of, of carbon pricing, which I know you, you mentioned in your response there, we, we just saw a very big uh, delegation of Canadians in Paris for uh, the UN's climate summit, and this is obviously just because of timing, uh, ending up being one of uh, the first big projects that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau has had to tackle. And I know there have been a lot of onlookers that have said that you know some of the recommendations that that are likely to come of this are things that will end up uh, being uh, policies or proposals that will cost taxpayers, will cost business, etc. Is uh, a climate change a priority for you? Is this something you think the government should be dealing with, or, or do you think it's more of, a, of an inflated issue that isn't really as necessary to tackle the way it's, it's likely to be tackled? Well, climate change is an issue that everyone accepts is happening around the world, but how you approach it um, I think speaks volumes. And I, I think, you know, if we look in the past at how other environmental issues have been dealt with, like acid rain, for instance, and it, that was under the Mulroney government, they used a market-based approach to deal with that, to incent companies and businesses to deal with acid rain. It wasn't a punitive measure. So when you look at or you know, p- people like the Ontario government, the Notley government in, in, in Alberta, uh, using punitive policy levers to basically raise the cost of everything in the hopes that people will not consume as much. We've seen that doesn't work in other jurisdictions around the world. All it is is a, is a way to collect revenue out of the pockets of Canadians so that the government has more money to spend. Uh, so I think that we need to look at market-based solutions that actually incent people. And if you're going to introduce carbon pricing, the least you could do is make it revenue neutral, like British Columbia did. They introduced a carbon price, but they lowered income taxes as a way to offset the increase in cost. So they were trying to incent people to you know, drive more fuel-efficient cars, but at the same time, they didn't hurt their pocketbook. They actually reduced their income taxes at the same time. So I think that there's a responsible way to approach this, and it shouldn't be just about reaching into people's pockets and using climate change as an excuse to tax people more. And we've seen that in Ontario with the, the massive increase in rates of energy. Uh, and subsidizing, Which aren't slowing down, by the way. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's unbelievable. And so that is a lesson for all the other jurisdictions in Canada that think that's a wise approach to take. So there's, there's other ways to approach this that I think are based in conservative conservative principles and market-based principles. Um, But I don't think that the Liberal government or the NDP governments um, are prone to that because for them, there's always a solution to everything, and that's to either subsidize something or to tax something. Um, And that's what we're seeing with their approach to climate change. I wanted to ask a little bit about where the Conservative Party needs to go from here uh, in terms of a broad policy issue, because you've you've talked about uh, the need to really keep to those core strengths that uh, Canadians uh, tend to align uh, with the Conservatives on. And you've said that there are, in a lot of ways, you know, these conservative policies that you can bring to the table on on issues that uh, the prime minister is raising, like, for example, a conservative answer to climate change, to tax cuts, etc., Is there, in your eyes, a change that needs to occur in how the the Conservative Party relays that messaging? Well, I think that it's, you know, I think what resonates the most and what resonated with me when I was a, you know, a younger person getting into politics was this notion of the difference between the government can solve everything versus individual responsibility and the ability for the government to create an environment where people can thrive, whether it's pride in owning your first home or pride in having a job or starting your own business. You know, you think about, so when you think about that, you know, it comes to mind things like, for instance, a policy, the tax-free savings account. The tax-free savings account was a policy brought in by the, by a government, our government, to help people save money in a tax-free way, remembering they've already paid tax on it when they put it into their tax-free savings account. So now they're just collecting um, ta- uh, uh You know, it's tax-free in terms of the gains that they make. They're able to take it out, plan for their retirement. 
Now, the Liberals came in and they clawed back half of the amount that you can put into a tax-free savings account. That's a perfect example of the difference in the philosophy between Liberals and Conservatives. Now, we know that millions, 11 million Canadians were using tax-free savings account, and over 80% of those were people in the lower and middle income bracket. But the Liberals said it was just rich people that were using tax-free savings accounts, so they got rid of the amount people put into them. Now, why would they do that when at the same time they're going to create a CPP and force people to save in the way they think they should save? Why not let people save and plan for their own retirement with their own ideas of what suits them best? So it's always this idea of, you know, individual responsibility versus the government knows best. And I think that, you know, that resonates a lot, especially with young people that believe more in a libertarian viewpoint of government and that want the government out of their lives, especially when you're dealing with things like the new digital economy and and others. And I think that, you know, there's a real opportunity for us to reconnect with people around the philosophical uh, views of conservatism, because we're much more about individual liberty, individual accountability, individual responsibility and with that comes smaller government and the opportunity for people to keep more of their money make more of their decisions um, and reach their potential in a way that fits with their own plans as opposed to the nanny state which we see in Ontario as you mentioned and we're now going to see Canada is the new Ontario I mean we're going right down that path across the country now with a lot of these new big programs that uh, the liberals are bringing in you threw out that word a couple of moments ago of, of libertarian and, and this idea of personal responsibility. Is there something to be said about having a, a conservative party that moves away from having a, a presence or, or at least a, a portion of, of its membership that is more identifying as social conservatives? Or do you think both need to coexist? Well, they already coexist. And I think that's the, that's the beauty of the conservative family is that we can have these wide-ranging discussions but still have respect for one another. Uh, for all the talk of Trudeau about uh, democracy and renewal, we're the only party in the House of Commons that allows free votes on conscious issues. So when those things come up, we've got you know 99 different people voting different ways, but everyone respects each other's views, and we move on um, instead of someone telling us how we should think about certain issues uh, around conscious rights. So I think you know that also speaks to the issue of individual, you know, individual liberty, allowing people to have their own views on things that on you know that are that are issues of morality or conscious so um i appreciate that about the conservative party so I guess one of the, the big questions then that we are, are brought to on the note of the, the party moving forward is, what is it that you're able to do uh, as an interim leader uh, without, I, I guess, pushing the, the party too far down a road that it makes the, the new permanent leader uh, or handicaps them a little bit at coming in with any change, but also wanting to make sure that there is action now? I, I mean, as that interim leader, you've talked about being a bridge builder before. What is it that you are sort of seeing in your own mind as the scope of what you should be doing in terms of the long-term or legacy implications of your party? Absolutely. Well, I think one of the opportunities uh, that I have is to, over the next few years, reconnect with a lot of Canadians across the country about what the Conservative movement is about. And there's a really strong message there that we've just been speaking about. But the other job that I have is to be a strong opposition leader. And we've hit the ground running in Parliament asking Trudeau very tough questions on things like uh, the war on ISIS and why he feels that a military, a robust military intervention with airstrikes, which is what all of our allies are being asked to contribute, Canada is now stepping back from. You know, we're we're giving uh, him uh, all the reasons why he should be there and support should he keep our CF-18s in the fight. But he refuses to do that and he wants to see us step back from that commitment against ISIS. So we're going to be, you know, holding him to account on a lot of these decisions that we think are, are wrong-headed, uh, but at the same time, we have to find a new leader. So we're going to have a leadership race over the next 18 months to potentially two years. We've got a number of people within our party that are interested in putting their name forward and a few that I believe will come from the outside of the party. So I think it'll be a, a great race. And to your point about policy, during the leadership race is when a lot of interesting things happen because the, the leadership hopefuls will put forward their vision for the party. It might be very different. It might be 
uh, something that aligns with, you know, our current policies, but it's a time to discuss those things. And then the membership of the, of the party will make a decision on who will take us into the next potentially decade in the conservative movement. So it's a really interesting time to be part of the movement, to see how it's shaped and how it moves forward. The big uh, big video going viral this morning is uh, a McLean's uh, Justin Trudeau in, in 60 seconds feature. I, I have to ask for your take on this because in it, uh, he was asked uh, which of the Baltic nations was his favorite. And he said in, a, in a, an admittedly very lighthearted manner, quote, uh, that's not a thing, unquote. Thoughts on that? I haven't seen that. Uh, that's unfortunate. Is that, I don't know if it's recent. I'll have to, I'll have to go on, um, you know, on, online and see that. I thought you were going to tell me about his Star Wars interview. <laughs> no, uh, that's, that's also one of the other big policy items I think he's talking about. It's his affinity for Star Wars. You know, I think, I think the concern we have about some of the foreign, uh, foreign policy issues, particularly the issue around the fight against ISIS, is... Um, my my concern is that uh, he doesn't take these issues as seriously as he should. Now, for instance, uh, President Obama said uh, that one of the main pillars to defeat ISIS is airstrikes. He said that just a week ago in his address to the United States. And Ash Carter, has, who is the Secretary of Defense in the U.S., is calling on all of the U.S. allies to step up their military intervention. Now, everyone agrees that we have to do more from a humanitarian point of view. We have to participate in the diplomacy to end this war in Syria and Iraq. But there's no doubt that the only way to stop these guys, because they are also a conventional army in terms of what they're using on the ground to fight and kill people, uh, is military intervention is necessary. And so we're facing a genocidal death cult, an organization that rapes and enslaves women and children. I mean, we've never seen anything like this in, in our generation. And at a time when the world needs us, we've never in our history not been there. And, and now we're stepping back. And I think that's, I think it's shameful. So I've said to the prime minister, please, you know, reconsider your decision. You would have our full support um, in any you know, in any way forward from a military point of view. Um, and I think it's, you know, and his, his line is that our CF-18s aren't doing anything that's significant. So why have them there? Well, we've heard from the Kurdish forces, we've heard from our other allied partners that they are making a significant difference. So, um, again, this is a, just a political commitment that he made during the election. But since the election, we've seen attacks in Beirut, we've seen attacks in Paris, um, and I think that uh, things have changed. And so my hope was that he would listen and that he would keep our CF-18s uh, in the fight against ISIS. All right. Well, that was uh, an answer to a different question, but still a good uh, a good one at that. I, I've got to take a break uh, for news here, but I want to thank you, uh, the Honorable uh, Rana Ambrose, leader of the official opposition, for coming on the program today. I really do appreciate it. Well, thank you. I appreciate it very much. And uh, it's great to be on with an irreverent uh, host. <laughs> I uh, greatly appreciate that. We look forward to chatting with you here in London. Thanks, Andrew. That was Rana Ambrose on my show. And I was really, really pleased to have that much time to talk to her. I mean, obviously, she's introducing herself to a lot of Canadians. And I can't stress enough that her role is, I think, more important than a lot of people seem to realize. She's not a placeholder. She's not there until someone better comes along. She is the one tasked with managing the party for the next couple of years. Yeah, someone else is going to come along. But her role is important. She is the lead voice of conservatism. Now, I am a climate change denier, as I've been called, or a skeptic. I prefer just a climate change honest person. But in any case, so obviously we heard from there an unequivocal position that she thinks climate change is an issue, although she doesn't want it to be used as an excuse to raise taxes. So at least I agree with half of that. And she is unequivocal about criticizing Justin Trudeau's position and lack of fortitude on ISIS, even if I hadn't asked about it. I was glad that she, she brought it up anyway, because it was a good thing to say. But, but what do you think, though? What do you think? I mean, first off, she is accessible. That's good. For a party that has uh, received a lot of criticism and just been dogged by the media on being inaccessible and closed down, 
I think the conservatives need to come up with a new strategy than the one they were employing, especially in the latter years under Stephen Harper. They can't be closed off, especially when you're up against Prime Minister Selfie who thinks everything is an opportunity to talk to reporters, everything is an opportunity to engage with Canadians and all this sort of stuff. And even though we're going to see that clamp down, I know we're going to see it tighten up. And the reason I know that is because I know that it is easy when you're not being challenged to be open and accessible. When CBC wants nothing more than to have a selfie with you and CBC reporters want to have a selfie selfie with you. It's easy to be available for that. The second the shit hits the fan though, the second he has his first scandal, the second he has his first instance of things being wrong. That's when it'll start to change. That's when the rules of engagement will change just a little bit to start. And that's when, as Canadians, we'll start seeing less and less and less of Trudeau. And I think when he learns that, it'll be great vindication for most of the country. Because we'll learn that, hey, that was actually how you run the show. You don't spend all day getting heckled by reporters. You get down to business. But there is a perception issue that needs to be managed. There's a perception issue that I think needs to be more central to what conservatives are about as a party than just simply expecting the message itself to sell. And I'm not sure that I like that. In fact, I know that I'm not. I would love to have substance over style, especially now that we've seen the very portrait of what style over substance looks like running the country. But the fact is he won. The conservatives got whooped. And I'm not inflating the numbers here. The fact is the liberals have a majority government. The political system that they claim to hate gave them a majority government. And by the way, you don't hear people complaining about it, but that's another story. And the reform that the liberals are proposing now electorally is one that they're not even allowing a referendum to be held on. Yet they want to change the way Canadians vote. We'll talk about that a little bit more later on in the show, but I have to take a break. When we come back, more Lawton Online on the rebel.media. Stay tuned. You're listening to Lawton Online with your host, Andrew Lawton, exclusively on the rebel.media. Email your thoughts to Andrew at andrewlawton.ca or tweet Andrew using at Andrew Lawton. And we are back, Lawton Online, here on the rebel.media. My name is, as you could have guessed probably, because you've been listening through to the show, I hope, Andrew Lawton. I mentioned a couple of moments ago this idea of democratic reform. And this idea of how in Canada we should go about changing our elections and the way we vote, if at all we want to go down that road. Now, I'm not sure we need to. I'm not sure that we need something other than first past the post as a way to have our elections. Not because I I don't think other systems work, but just because I don't think you need to reinvent the wheel if it's not really broken yet. The only people who complain about the system are the losers of the system. And I think that tells volumes. Because no matter what, there are going to be losers. And no matter what, those losers are going to think that a different system could have given them more support. That's why the biggest champion of electoral reform has always been the Green Party. Just let that sink in for a moment. But Trudeau wants ranked ballots. And the reason he wants that is because he knows that the Liberals will be every single Canadian's second choice. When you have essentially one party from the right and a myriad of parties from the left... Justin Trudeau's banking on the fact that anyone who votes for the NDP, for the Green, is going to have Liberals as their second choice. So ranked ballot is not a bold and defiant stand for democracy. It is a political ploy. And hey, any party wants a system that's going to benefit them. I'm prepared to give them that one. Not give them the system, but give them the point for raising it. But now they don't even want to go through the motions of consulting Canadians on this system that they apparently don't think reflects the needs and values and views of Canadians enough. So 
well, wait, I, why are you changing? If you don't care what Canadians think, why are you saying you do? And why are you saying our system needs to change because of it? Well, there's a campaign called DefendDemocracy.ca led by uh, Harrison Roos, which is aiming to answer that question. It's not weighing in on the issue of electoral reform, but more on the fact that if reform is going to happen, it should be something that is born of a consultation with Canadians. Essentially, Trudeau needs to have a referendum if he wants to change the system. That's the goal of DefendDemocracy.ca. So Harrison Roos joins me, former Sun News Network staffer, also a former political staffer, and now coordinator of uh, DefendDemocracy.ca. Uh, Harrison Roos, great to have you on the show, sir. Thanks for your time today. You have... Thanks very much for having me on, Andrew. So, so let's give a, a little bit of a rundown on what it is that's actually on the table as far as the reforms go. Well, at the moment, we don't really know. The Liberals made a campaign pledge during the election that it would be the last election ever with first-past-the-post. So whatever reform we bring in presumably then won't include first-past-the-post. But beyond that, we don't really know what reform package they're proposing. So I think it's important to say, and and you alluded to this uh, off the top, that uh, I'm not advocating for or against reform. The petition isn't about reform being good or bad. It's simply that if we are going to change how our democracy fundamentally works, you need to have the final say going to Canadians themselves and not a majority government that has a vested interest in the outcome of the reform. Yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, one of the items that's been brought up, as I mentioned a couple of moments ago, is the possibility of ranked balloting. And there have been a lot of uh, speculators and observers and pundits and even, I mean, political science professors who have said, well, it stands to reason that the Liberals think that they'll be everyone's second choice. So if you have ranked balloting, people might say, okay, Green Party and then Liberal is their second, or NDP and then Liberal is their second. So it could be a very self-interested proposal. And there are other options that have been put forward, like mixed member proportional, which was what there was a, a referendum in uh, Ontario for, I think, back in 2007. You have a, a full-on proportional representation, which is another possibility, which carries with it its own struggles. So there are a lot of different ways this could go. I don't see how this is something that, first off, can be expedited to a three-year process, especially if the decisions are going to be made by 338 people in Ottawa. I suspect that uh, if the government did uh, seriously want to have this done in three years, they probably could. I, I, this, is, this, to me, would be the ideal scenario. The Liberals have promised consultation and, and uh, committee hearings and all this sort of thing. I think they should do that. I think they should spend a year talking to everybody they can talk to, consulting with everybody they can consult, and put together the very best possible reform package that they can come up with. They should pass it in the House of Commons, they should get the Senate to pass it, and then before the Governor General signs it, it needs to go to Canadians with a very clearly worded referendum question, do you support this reform package, yes or no? And if Canadians vote yes, then it should be signed into law. If Canadians vote no, then we have to respect the will of the people. And I don't want to prejudge what the reform package may or may not be, because as you say, there are many different possibilities on the table. And I have no idea what one they're going to uh, end up coming to. And if they're going to do this in a way that is uh, as neutral as they can do it, or if it's going to be more partisan or any of those things, I, I don't know the answer to. I don't, I, my crystal ball is not working well enough for that. But I think that it, do, it, it fundamentally doesn't matter what the reform package is going to be to say that Canadians have to have the final say. What should the threshold for yes be? Because I I don't think it's enough to have, you know, 50% plus one when you're talking about something so massive. Or is that, I mean, by the definition of democracy, all that should be needed to constitute a a success as far as a referendum goes? There's been different approaches to this uh, in Canada, even. Uh, You mentioned the referendum in 2007 in Ontario. That was a a 50% plus one referendum on changing the voting system in Ontario. Prince Edward Island did the same thing in 2005. Uh, British Columbia has actually had two referenda on electoral reform. One in 2005 needed a 60% threshold, uh, and it came up short at about 55%. And then a second one in 2009 only needed about, uh, need, only needed 50%, though support then dropped down to, I think, it was close to 40%. So uh, there are different approaches to it. Internationally, there have been refer- referenda on electoral reform. The UK did one in 2011. New Zealand's had three in the last uh, 20 years or so, in 92, 93, and 2011. So it, it certainly is the norm that before a jurisdiction changes their democracy, that it goes to a referendum. 
I'm hopeful that the liberals will ultimately agree with that, particularly since it's liberal governments in uh, several of the provinces that have done this. It is liberal governments that uh, brought in referenda on electoral reform. So I, I, I suspect, I'm hopeful, that they, they will yield because they want the electoral reform to have legitimacy. And I, I, I just don't see how you arrive at legitimacy if uh, all it takes to change our democracy itself is just a, an act in, in the House of Commons. Because it wouldn't be too difficult then to see a scenario where government after government changes the electoral system. And, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and I don't think any Canadian would, would seriously argue that that's a, a desirable outcome. And I think one important uh, item to point out here as well is that when we look at the contrast component of it here, Justin Trudeau has uh, positioned himself and his premiership as that of the people. You know, when you have uh, him coming after a prime minister who was to the Canadian public generally seen as pretty closed off, pretty inaccessible to media. Justin Trudeau has swung the pendulum in the other direction from, you know, walking from center block to uh, Langevin, his office, and taking questions from media the whole time to using the press room. He, he's done this whole uh, accessible to the people of the people and has talked about giving Canadians a, a voice again. So it, it seems particularly ironic and I would say at worst hypocritical to not be able to commit as simply a no-brainer to making this something that the people get to vote on. So I'm not sure why he seems to be ignorant to that reality here. I suspect that it's that they haven't fully formed their plan on it. I, I think that their electoral reform uh, portion in their campaign was, you know, something that came about when they were in third place. It's It's a policy that clearly wasn't fully formed because all the policy consisted of it was that we're getting rid of first past the post. That doesn't really tell us much. Uh, about what the new system is going to be. So I suspect it's that they, they simply haven't fully formed their policy yet. As I say, I'm hopeful that uh, that a referendum will become part of their plan as it is hashed out. And and I suspect that, that if uh, Prime Minister Trudeau is serious about being uh, Prime Minister for the people, that uh, a petition like the one we've launched, as you mentioned on defenddemocracy.ca, a petition like that really can carry some weight. And, and so I'm hopeful that uh, that people will sign it. Now, this is not a uh, politically driven process, although you uh, did work in the PMO in the past, but this is a, a completely nonpartisan effort, correct? Yeah, no, that's it. This is not uh, not an effort from the political parties. I'm not taking any money from anybody for my efforts here. Uh, this is something that, that I believe in that is important, and I'm hopeful that uh, other Canadians of all political stripes will agree that uh, our democracy is worth fighting for. And I guess when it comes down to it, is it difficult for you, and I know it's still in the early days of this campaign, but is it difficult for you to have uh, a, a campaign devoted entirely to the process without being able to weigh in on the actual substance of what a reform would look like? Because, I mean, I'm, I'm in radio, so I have to fill time. So I would be wanting to get into all of these different other areas, but it seems like you're focused just on the question of how we get there, not where we get. Well, I, I think the, the process in this is ultimately important because it, our, our democratic system depends on our electoral system, that we have a representative democracy, that we have a prime minister, that we have a Senate that perhaps needs some work. These are all important process questions. And they're maybe not always the, the sexiest questions or the most exciting questions. And, uh, and I fully recognize that often people don't really pay much attention to politics outside of voting time. But next time you cast your ballot, it may not work the same way. And so I think this is an important thing for, for Canadians everywhere to be concerned about. And, and I think it's important as well that on electoral reform, because our democracy does have to work for everybody, that everybody be involved and everybody have a say, and everybody does seriously, openly discuss different reform proposals. And there's arguments for and against the status quo. There are arguments for and against different reform proposals. So I think it's really important that that a concerted effort be made towards coming up with the best possible reform proposal and then putting it to Canadians and, and Canadians can decide if that best possible reform proposal is better than the status quo or not. I know that you mentioned a couple of moments ago that your theory on this, which I think carries a lot of weight, is that the Liberals are probably still trying to formulate how they're going to approach this issue. Uh, Conservatives have been very much uh, in favour of, of the messaging that you've been putting forward, it looks like. Uh, where are the NDP falling in this? And not that they're, I mean, ma major players, but just for, for a holistic picture of the Green Party as well. I think the NDP are, are significant players in our democracy, of course. They were the official opposition up until a couple months ago. 20% of Canadians still voted for them. Uh, uh, where the are NDP... they on the idea of a referendum, though? 
I, I'm not entirely clear on that. I, I think there may be a bit of a divide within the NDP between the urban MPs or the urban parts of the party and the more rural parts of the party. The urban folks, I think, would be perfectly happy to see reform go through without a referendum because I, I think they have some partisan advantage in that. I think the more rural parts of the NDP would be more inclined to be open to a referendum because those roots within the NDP tend to be more on the populist side of things, the people who tend to err on the side of giving a direct vote, a direct voice for the people. So I, the NDP have been a little clearer, unclear on it, and uh, I'm, I'm guessing, because I'm certainly not an insider on that side of the fence, uh, I'm guessing that they may be having a bit of an internal discussion about where they should stand on the question of a reform. I'm joined by Harrison Roos of DefendDemocracy.ca, a grassroots petition to uh, put pressure on uh, Justin Trudeau's government on a national referendum for electoral reform. Uh, what are the next steps for you, Harrison? Really, the main thing is uh, is to talk to Canadians, to have Canadians think about this issue, and and hopefully, ultimately, uh, put a signature on this position on this petition that can then be presented to the government and the House of Commons, and and then we can say with with a loud voice all together that uh, you know it's important that Canadians have the last word on electoral reform, whatever that last word might be. Uh, Harrison Roos joining me from DefendDemocracy.ca. Uh, really appreciate your time, Harrison. Thanks for your work on this. Thanks very much for having me on, Andrew. That uh, petition, again, can be found at DefendDemocracy.ca. We've got to take a quick break here. When we come back, we'll have more lot online on the rebel.media. Stay tuned. It's time for It Must Be a Liberal, only on Lawton Online. Scouring every corner of the globe for stories so outrageous, there must be a liberal involved. Yes, you heard the man. It's time for It Must Be a Liberal, scouring every corner of the globe from Timbuktu to Ch- Tajikistan, from Uganda to Uzbekistan, finding these stories so outrageous there must be a liberal involved. And today we don't actually have to go all that far. Our story today is actually out of Iowa, where a reporter named Adam Sallet was on KIMT, a news station down there, doing a live hit covering a bank robbery. He was standing outside the bank. He was talking about the robbery and what had happened. And then something that most people wouldn't expect happened. The robber apparently came back, the same robber from the day before, to rob the bank again for the second time in as many days. So during the live hit, the bank manager or bank employee runs out of the bank towards the TV camera and says, that's the robber, that's the robber, that's the robber. So the reporter, Adam Sallett, says, I have to go, I have to call 911. This is live TV, folks. So the winner of It Must Be a Liberal Today is not Adam Sallett, the brave and intrepid reporter who literally ran off camera after the robber. We still don't know if he actually caught the guy. But the It Must Be a Liberal is the robber who sees that a live newscast is going on and returns to the same bank he had robbed about 24 hours prior. Safe to say, not the sharpest tool in the shed, not the brightest bulb in the socket, and certainly a liberal, I would say. Yes, it's safe to say when you pull off that kind of stunt, not even a heist, it's a stunt. It must be a liberal, folks. That concludes this program for today. We'll be back with one more show before Christmas, and that's coming up in one week. This is Lawton Online. My name's Andrew Lawton, and you're tuned in to the Rebel.media. Thanks so much, Canada. Thanks for tuning in to Lawton Online. Check out the rebel.media for lots more fearless content and commentary.